Oh, do you guys smell that? Wow, this is weird because I'm in your device and yet we can both smell the same thing. Technology is getting wild because since you clicked on this, I imagine you're smelling the same bulk as me. Since people who talk music on the internet have spread it everywhere and so the smell seems to be about. And this is bad because some of you really mess up your music's growth or mentally torture yourselves because you believe some of the bullshit spread that you see on the internet. And I'm here to free you from these bad thoughts and the bullshit that keeps you down. And I'm gonna do it as fast as I can since I am still, much to my comment section's pain, in my calling out the bullshit era and well, I'm not done being messy. So one of the most cursed things you'll find on Reddit, this side of that am I the asshole subreddit, is the brain dead comments you see on music Reddit. And there's one that falls into a category that I coined as Canon's Law, which I named after Godwin's Law. Canon's Law is that any discussion on a forum about promoting music will eventually lead to some brain genius commenting while they stroke their Rick Rubin-like beard of wisdom and say, good music promotes itself. So this one is complicated since good music will often make mid, if not even bad marketing work way better, but you still need to get it heard. And it's tough since what some people mean by this statement is that when a song is really susceptible, it will do most of the work for you. And for those of you who slept through that lesson when I taught it, what song susceptibility is, is how likely a listener is to like something when they hear it. And each song has a different level of that. Anyway, depending on how likely it is when someone hears the song, they are to like it, as it gets spread from person to person, is a huge factor in how well a song does. Like some songs are literally thousands of times more susceptible than others. Just compare a Mersbo track that's just a brace of noise to say a song like Hey Ya by Outkast, which is one of those songs that almost everyone loves when they hear it at first. Anyway, that's not really what a lot of people mean when they say this on Reddit forums though. The thought is if the song is good, you won't even need to promote it. It will just get a buzz eventually when you have like a hundred people who have ever heard it. And to that, I gotta say, that's bullshit. And I will tell you, we see this clearly all the time. Take a group like South Arcade, who I recently covered on my members only feed, where I dissect the musicians who are breaking their music right now and how they went about growing it. Anyway, South Arcade did pretty well when they released their song Danger, since it's a great song. I bang it off in myself. But it took a year later of them pushing on TikTok and now it really blew up. And this is because oftentimes a susceptible song needs to find the right audience that is way more likely to love that song. After all, we have so many thousands of choices of a song to listen to in any genre that we like. So we need to find an audience that is susceptible to liking your song for them to hear it, not just a random hundred people that you happen to know at first. And oftentimes, if you get into another corner of the algorithm that has an audience that's more susceptible, well, all of a sudden, a song can really take off. And if you look at some of South Arcade's most recent videos that got around 10 million views combined, that's a lot of people hearing an earworm and potential converts to a great song. We see this constantly in that many of the songs that would have blown up if they were pushed in a smart way and get tons of streams and a new life when the artist gets discovered, sometimes even years later, those songs become some of their top songs on their Spotify most popular list. Since an audience finally explores their catalog, whereas the less susceptible songs, well, they stay having very few plays, as we see and I demonstrated recently when you see these artists with millions of plays on some songs and like a hundred on other. But since musicians with no fan base, biggest problem is obscurity, meaning that no one even hears them to decide if they like them or not, you need to do the work to find your audience and right now, short form video, if you do it right, can find you an audience like nothing else ever has. And it's your best chance of getting your music to the people most susceptible to it, since you can target them. The question just will be, does it actually convert people into listeners and fans? And right after I hear this, pretty soon after, I'll be scrolling through Reddit and there'll be another comment that says, I shouldn't have to post on TikTok. This is the most unfair to musicians era we've ever had. We have to do too much work. What? Dog, I got bad news for you. I've been doing this for quite a while and I have of course met people who've been doing this way longer, but this is just straight up untrue. And I can hear a lot of things about how grueling the grind is from our day jobs and the mental health issues we all have from this modern hellhole we're living in, making things difficult for you to create and promote your music. But when it comes to the time and effort you need to put into promoting your music to get it heard by millions of people, this is the best era we've ever been in for amount of hours you could put in to have 
the most amount of people listen to your music. Even a decade ago, musicians would have to go on radio tours from station to station. Hell, actually, this still happens to break country artists today since that system is still incredibly gatekept. But a group like Radiohead 25 years ago made a movie about how awful it was to break as a band in the 90s, having to do interviews all night and day before and after shows and traveling and saying the same thing over and over and over again. And yes, these groups were paid way better than you would be today if you sold the same amount of copies as them. But the amount of hours they had to put in to get discovered and have millions of people hear their music was far harder than what you have to do today. Groups in the 80s, every time they played a show, would have to put mailing list labels on every letter and spend a ton of money to get people out to shows or spend hours printing and flyering for each one. What? Now you do this from home in a few minutes. Sorry, it's not comparable how much easier you have it when it comes to hours to clock to get your song heard today. And there's very little good news in the music business today, so let's take the win where we can. But too often, right after that, I hear, Jesse, it takes a long time to make three videos a day. Never mind 60 days to promote your song. That's 180 videos. That's a full-time job. Remember that members only feed I talked about that I do here on YouTube that I just mentioned where for $5 a month, I break down how the artists who are breaking in music today are doing it just like the ones you can see on the screen right now. Well, there's a link in the description to see that. But here's the thing. As someone who studies this and shows what I'm studying every single week to you all, it is simply not true that you have to do all that. While if you want to be the next Addison Ray or Tube Girl, you should definitely post three times a day. Most of the musicians whose songs are going viral aren't even posting every single day. Now, some of them already had big platforms, so a lot of them didn't need to do that since their posts are far more effective than yours because they have followers and the algorithm knows who they are and knows who to send their videos to. But really, most of the artists blowing up from really small following seem to do best in the three to seven videos a week range by focusing on good ideas and quality posts that align with the emotion of their song. And there's some outliers who post more than that, doing replies, stitches, and duets. But honestly, the three to seven videos range really does seem to be the media. And that's about one third of that 180 videos that people complain in my comments about all day as if I'm like, torturing them or something. Hey! But the real reality is if you're trying to get your music heard, dedicating yourself to trying to post seven times a week, you'll be doing right by your music. But some of any of you say this is all too much work with all the graphics you need to make for album art, tour ad mats, stories for announcements, banners, thumbnails for YouTube, which is why I wanna just take a minute to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Penji, who I think is solving a problem a lot of musicians have in a really cool way. Penji is your in-house creative team, but without the hassle of hiring somebody and overhead costs, all the time you spend hiring and waiting for the people to do design work for you while they constantly blow deadlines is truly one of the worst parts about promoting your music, but Penji solves that. No hiring, no contracts, no more missed deadlines. Instead, you get an agency trained creative at a fixed cost via a subscription you pay each month. Penji's graphic design service supports over 25,000 brands and agencies worldwide, including known brands such as Reebok, Pep Boys, 1-800-Flowers, Express, and WWE, and many more, so you know this service is reliable. All you do is submit the work you need done, which only takes a few minutes, then receive back a design. And if you aren't happy, you get as many revisions as you want from the designer who understands how your projects look. You get designs back in 24 to 48 hours. They have actual humans doing the support and you have 100% ownership of the designs. And I know you're wondering about prices, so you should head over to Penji and check out their subscription service. In case you haven't noticed, I've been really upping my social game. So I chose Erica Olvera on Penji and they've been sending me really impressive work. And truly, the revision process was so much more friendly than dealing with some of the designers I work with who give me a ton of attitude when I want simple mistakes fixed. Sign up with my code, MuseFormation15, through the link in the description, and then focus on making some great songs instead of slaving over your graphic design. Okay, but we gotta get back to cleaning up this BS, because there's a lot of it. Another one of the more ridiculous thoughts I see in my comments is, Jesse, major labels control the charts. I know this is one of the things that is common with the internet phenomenon of someone stating a vibe that they kind of feel, but they've never actually done any research to back this up. So let's destroy this very fast. One instance I cite a lot is current buzz artist who did what a lot of people are calling the song of the summer, Chapel Roan, who put out a bunch of songs on Atlantic Records from 27 to 2018. 
when I was at Atlantic at this time. And I talked to her and thought she was really talented, but the songs didn't find an audience at that point. Atlantic dropped her and now they're on Island where they found a ton of success. Do you think if Atlantic could control who gets popular, they'd have dropped her, lost a huge investment to have another label make that money? Would they let this artist who obviously has hits in her and a song of the summer potentially? No, cause that's dumb. But also the song of the summer is clearly espresso, come on. The fact is, all you have to do to see how stupid this thought is, is go through the roster of the, any of the major labels. They all have them on their website and you can see how many artists they try to break and it doesn't work out. Despite all the data these labels have and are largely only signing artists who've gotten some traction these days. The fact is in this day and age when anyone can choose what song they're listening to with a few clicks, it just isn't a reality that the majors can control the charts. Since now the trends are made on the internet in the short form videos and sharing among friends when the song is great. It was true with that when radio was the most popular listener influence about a decade to 20 years ago that the major labels controlled it, aside from a few exceptions that got through the cracks. But right now is not a time I would call totally lawless in the music business, but it's breaking about as many laws as one of those videos on Channel 5's YouTube where he shows everyone stealing cars and doing drugs that I've never even heard the names of before. The fact is, no one can control what's on the charts right now because we're in a wild time. But we're still not done with the cavalcade of stupid. Because I still haven't talked about the number one way I use to see if someone has a traumatic brain injury in my comments, which is when I see Nipple babies are the only ones who get signed. Now, years ago I made a video on this that thoroughly debunked how stupid this one is. So if you're still not convinced, feel free to watch that as it's linked in the description. But let's do this. So anyone who has ever worked at a big label or management can tell you from time to time, you need to be with both the kid of a rich person or sometimes just your boss's dentist's nephew who's an aspiring clout core artist as a courtesy to your boss's relationship with the person who pulls their cavities. It's really annoying, but it's a thing that needs to be done when you work at these places. When I was at the peak of my record production career with a nine month waiting period for anyone to get into the studio and working 16 hour days, I'd have to lose sleep since I'd have to take an hour to do my lawyer a favor and have the guy who mows his 200 acre estate's lawn because he's an emo band that wanted to work with me and they wanted to have me listen to their demos. This is all to say, Nepo babies often get their feet in the door for connections. But a thing you can easily see if you just look at the location tag of any of the major labels is a lot of people taking pictures that say big things coming, except those big things never come. The meeting happens with this Nepo baby and the label says, sorry, keep developing and hit us when you have something new you're excited about. In 99.9% .9 of the time, the big things don't come. But with the Nepo baby, they often have access to one, a lot of support from creative parents to not have a real job and focus on music. Two, access to people who give them good answers on what to do, like someone who's a great mixer or even advice on what to focus on from someone who's actually in the business. Or three, the promise that if you sign them, some of the parents' connections will help out. So that sometimes sweetens the deal and helps out. Whereas a lot of you never get in front of anyone and frankly go through bouts of depression, lack of motivation, and don't build momentum. And cause you work that day job, you don't realize your artistic voice. But really by the numbers, the people whose parents have blue next to their name on Wikipedia is not most of the people who you're seeing on the charts and blow up. But you internet detectives sure love finding anyone who has the same name as a buzzy new singer's parents. And you'll start to spread that that's the parent of everyone's new favorite rapper, slumlord influencer's dad. And they're the president of Exxon when they just have the same name as that person. Seriously, this internet detective work, you all either need to get better at being a detective or stop. And now we get to a really dumb one, but an important one. I've been hearing a lot lately since some of those TikTok accounts that clip podcasts love to take the context out of everything and show controversial takes. And we'll see one of these music marketing influence geniuses over here say something like, editorial playlist over. So this is one I hear mostly from people who really don't understand how things work and frankly, aren't thinking too hard about things. But those of us who read data actually see something. The artists who get on editorial playlists get more or algorithmic playlist plays. And algorithmic playlist plays are often the majority of plays for many big artists. This is because being next to those artists on those editorial playlists who have lots of algorithmic connections gets you algorithmic connection to those artists you were on the playlist with. Therefore, you have more opportunities to get streamed. So when I hear geniuses say things like, I'm not focused on editorial playlists. 
I think, yeah, you'd have to be an idiot to focus on a thing where the only thing you have to do in that focus is have a song done, then take 15 minutes to write a pitch and click send. Which, oh yeah, if you don't know about that, you can learn it on my video that's helped thousands of musicians, which is in the description. And then there's nothing else to do. So if your focus is on something that takes 15 minutes, well, yeah, you'd be an idiot and you're not getting much done. But this is all to say, when people tell you editorial playlists don't matter and don't get you fans who last, that's not really seeing the big picture here. And yes, by nature, many of the listeners to playlists are hitting play to solve a problem for a few hours to have something to listen to. And if they don't love you, well, you lose those listeners when you drop off the playlist. But one of the things I see with the bigger artists I work with is those playlists convert listeners over to them and they get in those algorithmic playlists, which often helps convert listeners into long-term fans. But those algorithmic playlist streams they help get you into are the real gift that keeps giving you streams for years to come and making you new fans. We even talked about this on my stream with Health, who are on plenty of editorial playlists. And as I make this video, I have almost 2.5 million monthly listeners. If you want to hear it firsthand, well, click it in the description. But lastly, we have one final idiotic thought. A new confusing one for me that I see all the time is, I need to build catalogs, so I have 33 songs. Since all the top artists in the top 500 on Spotify have more than 33 songs. So in my last video, I obviously went in pretty hard on the myth of catalog being a thing that always helps you. But the idea that just getting a bunch of songs out there is what built these artists up is one of those things where we could use it to test if you have a brain worm, like that one guy running for president right now. What? But to discuss this a little further, well, most of the artists in the top 200, yes, have 33 songs. This could also be like finding out all of them have toenails that are above a certain amount of thickness. This is not the determinative factor that got them to be one of the biggest artists is the consistency of their work with it being exposed to an audience that likes it. You need a lot of songs people can continually consume, but they need to be exceptional. Since many of the artists, not even in the top 500, have 36 songs that audiences love. So you better really come armed with some exceptional songs. Since literally, there's hundreds of thousands of artists with over 33 songs that are literally in the bottom 200. And frankly, most of the artists with that many songs are very weighed down because they pump out crap all day. And honestly, this isn't even accurate because if you look at how many unique songs Artemis has in his catalog right now, it doesn't add up to 33. And yet he's in the top 100 of all artists right now. The point is focus on writing good songs, because that's much more important. So if you've enjoyed me calling out dumb ideas, my video that I mentioned before on Nepo Babies is on the screen right now. I highly suggest clicking it if you want to keep hearing me debunk these things. Thanks for watching.